Good evening. This is Eugene Chan on Straight Talk. Our guest this evening is Professor Po Yip, the founding director of the Center for Suicide Research and Prevention at the University of Hong Kong and a chair professor at the university's Department of Social Work and Social Administration. This evening, we want to ask Professor Yip, how can we inspire our youth? Welcome, Paul. Welcome, Eugene. Um, a few weeks ago, we had the Secretary for Home and Youth Affairs, Alice Mack, on the show, and we asked her how our youth can be empowered to success. She shared with us the government's first youth blueprint and how it aims to provide an enabling environment for young people to unleash their potential. I think we all agree that, for, that youth issues are not straightforward matter, but I'm sure many of the viewers, including both parents and the youth themselves, will benefit from your insight. So maybe we can start by getting some views from you. What characterizes our Hong Kong youth of today? Well, I think thank you for the uh, continuous improvement of the education opportunities for our young people. I think in the past uh, two decades, I think our young people, their educational opportunities has increased. So most of them, they are better educated. Right. I think according to the latest census, I think uh, nearly, I think 60% of our young people, I think they receive the post-secondary education. So I uh, think they are smarter and then they're better informed. Right, I, I suppose this is what you said in the public uh, arena. You said this generation is like no other. So are you saying that they are actually more educated and more, have more exposure compared to youth of the past generations? Well, they not only have more exposures, I think they also uh, like to be able to participate, it, I think, in a lot of things. They like to have some ownership, I think, of the, of the futures, and then they also like to be... I uh, want their no voice to be heard. Right. I asked um, Secretary Ellis last time when she was here. I said, "What actually under the, what, what actually who are actually under the group of youth?" And she told me, "Is over like over two million population between 15 to 40." So when you when you just mentioned that the our youth are more exposure, they are more keen to participate. Are they different to the past youth that or maybe maybe the the last previous generations that we had? I think in the previous generation, I think because um, I think the living standards are not uh, as high as now, and then they are really, uh, really working very hard, I think, uh, to get themselves fit. But now, I think because of the hard work of the parents, I think they provide a better environment for them. But now, so what they're looking for is not only a job, it's not looking for an apartment, although it is very difficult to have an apartment now, but they always like to have their quality of life. I mean, the quality of life means the sense of um, a, a good environment which can really bring the best out of them. Um, another area I'm sure all of us will agree that the social media of current state is much more prevalent than in our time. And um, a lot of people saying that this is a two-edged sword. Um, in your opinion, is it better or is it, uh, or is it positive or negative? Maybe I'll use those words. Well, I would say that it is a good servant, but a bad master. Right. I think in our data, it showed that I think for those young people who spend more time on social media or too much time on social media, I think their mental health are not very good. On the other hand, I think if they uh, uh, use their time wisely, I think use the social media to connect to people, to acquire for the knowledge, and actually they are doing okay. So I think it is really as a matter of fact how I think they can make good use of this servant, I think, to serve their purposes. Right, Professor. Um, thank you for really setting the scene right at the beginning of the show, saying that they are pre prepared to participate, more exposure, more educated. Let's look at the challenges. I mean, we, of course, we are trying to support them. We we'll use the word help. Help isn't the most appropriate word, I don't think. Um, and now, you know, uh, our government, look at Mr. John Lee's manifesto. He, we always talk, talk about schooling. We talk about entrepreneurship, the career, or even uh, getting an apartment. But before we reach such big goals, the more general things that we want looking at are schooling, the family, or even starting to have a relationship, starting to look at the career. 
So you being an, an academic and you met a lot of university students over the time, do you think the difference in challenges of 2023 is different to the ones that we had in the past generations? I think in 2023, I think we, we have this sort of feelings of hopelessness, I think, among our young people. They have a sense of helplessness. I think they are so, so sometimes um, we, we really hope them, they, they do have a hope. Because right. once they have a hope, they will have the energy, I think, to put up with the hardship, I think, mean, to have the resilience, I think, mean, to put up all, all adversities. What we worry is what they call the laying threat, right? The laying threat is not, they want the laying threat. It is because I think they cannot see what good it will do, even if I work very hard, you know. So I think that what, one thing what we really uh, hope the government can do is to induce the hope and then to rebuild the trust, I think, among our young people. Well, Professor, you know, um, you being at the University of Hong Kong, you know, in the last few years, you're right at the center of kind of at the social unrest or what we call the riots. And we are now always talking about promoting social reconciliation. Uh, many young people involved in the social unrest were unfortunately arrested, but now um, just released from the, um, for the institution. And Secretary Chris Tang reported that 60 to 70 percent of those or with related to protest charges are on remorse. So many of them are students. So how can we, so I, won't, I won't use your help again, how can we assist them to get back to university or even get back to employment? What can the university or what can the government do? Well, I think, the, I think it, we, everyone, if they've done something wrong, if they have truly remorse for their action, and then we should give them a second chance. But as a matter of fact, I think uh, the government, I think the Commission of Police and a lot of other peoples they do to try to help our young people. I think what we really want to do is, is to try to help our young people to have a better understanding of the situation and then to give them the resources and the environment and such that they really can go back to the mainstream of the societies. Because at this moment, we have heard, I think, some of the university, they might not uh, accept the student back or some of the uh, employer, I mean, they do not want to give their job opportunities for these young people. And actually, I think that is very unfortunate because most of the young people, I think they do really want to put the thing behind and then I think to restart, I think, their life again. Right. Um, I think another matter that we must also touch on since you're here, that I'm sure all of you will want, all the viewers want to hear the insights, is about the impact of COVID. I believe you raised many concerns that last year, when the suspension of face-to-face -face classes at that time, and now all that has been reinstated, kind of. Um, are the worries over? Um, are there any lingering effects from that? Or, and also, what shall the educators do to be aware of this, this scenario that we went through? Well, I think, first of all, we have to, uh, 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 to reiterate, I think, the importance of schooling, I think, for young people. I think going to a school is, is, really, is, is a place not only they acquire the knowledge, but they build up the friendship. I think that's very important. I think uh, when we ask the young people, if you do have the problem, whom will you approach? They usually, it's not the social worker. No, I mean, they, they, they will approach, I think, their classmates, their friends. I think in the past three years, I mean, because of the disruption, I think, of the of the classes, and sometimes there's some relationship. I mean, they do not have the opportunity to establish. So I think um, um, during last year, I think what we have seen because of the school disruption, it does cause, I think, uh, a lot of anxiety among our young people, and such that the peer support cannot be established. So hopefully, I think now, I think the school uh, has, rest uh, has been restoring now, and then we are going to start the full day school again. And so hopefully, I think the school can take the time, I think, to rebuild this relationship and then to try to really make the school as a place where the support and the knowledge can be found, I think, uh, for our young people. Well, Professor, um, I'm sure in the past, past few years or even 10 years, many Hong Kong residents are not, are, are, are not satisfied with what the government can provide Hong Kong. But 
on the other hand, let's be sensible. I mean, government is only there to support when we are ready to put our work together. And of all the problems that you have you have said earlier, mainly hope is one thing that that's really been singled out. So that being one of the major issue that our youth has faced, uh, not lying flat, as you said, what can the community or actually government can should do or actually can achieve, in your view? Well, I think the, the government has indeed has done quite a bit. I mean, in the, I mean, they really try to engage the young people again, and then they like to create more opportunities in the Greater Bay Area for our young people. This is a good thing. So I think our young people, we do need opportunities. But at the same time, I think it is very really important, I think, for the government to realize that I think engaging our youth, it is not something is optional. It is not a, a it is not a gift. I think to the young people, I think if you're doing well, so I will uh, enlist you in the committee, because all the policy should be for our young people. Because the Hong Kong doesn't have a future if we do not have a young people. I mean, as what President Xi said, I mean the, I mean our future like on our young people. So we need our young people a better educator. We need our young people. They're more resilient. I think they need our young people. I think they can really help. I mean to make Hong Kong. I think to be sustainable in our development. Well, let's go to a break now. But viewers, please stay with us. We will be right back. Welcome back. With the recent release of Hong Kong's first youth blueprint, we have been continuing to talk about how we can engage better with our youth. And this week, we have Professor Yip from the University of Hong Kong. So Paul, in the first part, you have clearly stated hope is what is most needed amongst our youth and that they don't intend to lie flat and actually um, having them to uh, participate in a uh, the government committees isn't a gift but rather we should go into the crowd and engage with them. That's so a clear message in the first half. Um, let's go back to the, um, our ever first government first youth blueprint. And as you just rightly pointed out, that President Xi said clearly that with our youth being uh, doing well, Hong Kong will do well. And be, it's obvious because they are the future pillars of our society. When you look at the 160 plus initiatives at the, the youth blueprint, Secretary Ellis said that the vision, let me read it out to you, is to cultivate our youth into a generation that loves Hong Kong and our country, courts international perspectives, and possesses a positive mindset. They'll ramp up the sense of belonging to the country and Hong Kong among the youth, and they have a thorough understanding of the constitution and basic law. We understand that because we had a lot of issue with the law. But do you think these are the answers? Well, I think the goals are noble and they're important. And then uh, this 160 measure, I do hope, I think the government can implement it effectively and efficiently. So it is on the right track? It is on the right track. But furthermore, I think we need something more. I think we also need to address, I think some sort of fundamental mindset change of the government. I mean, for example, I take the examples that the government like to enlarge, I think the coverage of those, the consultation committees, I think to listen to our young people. I mean, it seems that the government is granting the right to some people, it's a, some sort of a reward, it's a gift. But if I were them, I would truly embrace, I think the, our young people in the whole population, the, policy formulation processes. We, we see this as co-creation because I think this policy are for them. So have you ever really brought them on the board and then to formulate this process together? I mean, sometimes we make them as one of the members, I think, but we do not really put them on. I think, I think that is, that's an idea, that's a mindset is very, very important. And then the other things, I think there's a lot of policies saying that I think if we involve our young people in the whole developmental processes, they are the indispensable, they're the essential for effective 
policy formulation and good governance. We have many experiences, overseas country and locally. Don't understand, don't underestimate our young people. I think they, I mean, they do not have to follow the old path. The old path might not work. The old path might not available anymore. So we really have to listen to them. We always provide the necessary resources. I think to working with them. I think sometimes you will, in our university, I mean, in some of our project, I mean, our young people always surprise us. I mean, with their own ideas. So I think it is a time that we really how to embrace them. I think from the very initial formalism uh, setting uh, the stage and up to the implementation. Yeah, Professor, with this first ever government's youth blueprint since the, since the return of sovereignty over 25 years or even before that, it's interesting that such an important document doesn't have much publicity. Or actually I heard that amongst the, the, the media friends or even amongst government friends, the, the community seems to be very, very lukewarm, lukewarm with, with this. Why do you think this is the case? Is it because it's not hitting the nail at the right place? I think it's... You can but you say it's on the right track. It is on the right track, but it is nothing exciting. No, but you, if you really want to excite our young people, I mean, you really have to address, I think, the so-called, the deep core problem. But at this moment, what I'm saying that the measures are good, but at the same time, I think we still have to address the fundamental concerns about our young people. They like to be represented. They like to be a voice to be heard. And then they like to be actually to take some ownership, I think, of the policy. But at this moment, is everything that, well, is this apparently is set up by the adults and at last young people, well, why don't you just hop in? No? I mean, and, but, but, but that is not what they want. I mean, the young people like to be in charge. Right. Um, Secretary L has also said that the government has to face the, the challenge how to efficiently communicate other young people. So my question was going to ask you, do you think they have succeeded in engaging with the youth? So will your answer be no? Well, I think it seems that, that they need to uh, work much harder, I mean, to re-engage our young people more effectively. I mean, what we have seen in the past, it does not work, well, work very well. I think in the 2019, when you see the social unrest, I mean, you see uh, uh, there's a lot of young people, I mean, they come out, I mean, they do express, I think, the dissatisfaction, I think, on the governance. Right, Paul, um, not only Secretary Ellis, but our Chief Executive John Lee, also in his manifesto, has categorically mentioned youth as a very important area. Do you think our youth actually felt their genuine intention and also do you think they will appreciate at least this gesture or at least this plans they have? I think I still can remember. I think there's a former chief executive say that young people, they do not have any stake in the society. That really hurts. Right. That really make a lot of young people. I think they are disappointed with the government. I think they, they're losing their trust. So I think at this moment, I think we really have to work very hard I think to rebuild the trust, and then, but this trust is not cannot rely on words. It's really not on the deeds. What actually we have done, I think, to re meet, I think, uh, the aspiration of our young people. But will you say that this government, with uh, having a new chapter, are we also in the right direction? Well, we wish them well. I mean, I really wish them that they can uh, really carry out, I think, what they have pledged and then do it effectively, do it efficiently, and also have an open mind to embrace our young people. I think, I mean, the Hong Kong, we do need our young people. And then we do need to train our young people to be smarter, so we'll be better, so understand um, Hong Kong, understand mainland, and then, then, then try to uh, uh, be a global citizen. I mean, to, to be able to happily to live in Hong Kong, continuously contribute, mm -hmm. I think, to the Hong Kong and the mainland development. All right, Paul, back in July last year, you wrote a, an article in the South China Morning Post and you highlighted five areas with, that government should improve 
how it should improve the lives of the Hong Kong youth, being the education reform to better recognize the non-academic talent, more resources for school and students, better community support, more family support and improved job and training opportunities. You have always been an advocate for that. Has the government listened to you? Well, I think the government just, um, I'm not so sure they're listening to me, but, but I think they are responding, I think, to this uh, issue one way or the other. I think we do see there are more opportunity uh, has been provided for our, uh, for our young people now. And then we do see some genuine effort, I mean, to improve, I think, the living accommodation, the living condition of our young people. I mean, all are the thing I you know, Right track, as I said, no, but but it re to make sure that it is um, it is sustainable. Mm -hmm. It can be done effectively. Right, going back to one of your your expertise is your in mental health. Has this been addressed in the blueprint? And how big a problem is it for Hong Kong youth? Because I'm sure the viewers will say, mental health. What's that? You see. So, um, you are also in, and I'm also very alarmed to to read that. Um, so, uh, because sometimes I do listen to your lectures that suicide is a leading cause of death for those in the 20 to 10 to 29 age group in Hong Kong. So let's shed some light on, the, on this issue while you're on the show. Well, we say no health without mental health. So mental health is a very essential issue. And also mental health, it does affect our young people, not only our young people, the whole community as well. Now, in our young people, indeed, I mean, we have seen there's a greater increase in suicide rate, and especially among our young, our young people. So I think we do need to, uh, to see a more concerted effort to improving the mental health of our young people. So I think we have to open up uh, this uh, online uh, emotional support system. I think it is supported by Hong Kong Jockey Club and maybe five NGOs. Then we really can see some of our young people are struggling. So we do need to give them the timely support. Is that at a, a sort of what we call an, 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 sort of an alarming state? Um, it, is at the, it is, yes, I would say that it's alarming because I think the rate has been increasing in the past five years and then we do not see a very genuine effort, I think, to really to improve the situation. Right, the last issue that we will talk about before the end of the show is we must reiterate Secretary Ellis's good intention to say that inspiring young people is more important and talking and telling the people what young people what to do isn't the, the right thing to do. So you being here now because the viewers, a quick tip, how we can help a senior or parents, how can we guide our youth, so-called? Well, I say they give them the resources give them an environment to develop and give them some responsibility. And then I think that we will bring the best uh, out of our young people. Thank you, Professor Yi, for coming this evening. Engaging the youth is not a simple matter, but the government is determined to tackle it. The currently high suicide rates cannot be ignored and we all need to reach out and become beacons of light to our young people. Have a good week and good night.